Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I am your host, Zen Sands. Today, in our Fly Me to the Moon segment, we're chatting with one of Virgin Galactic's founding astronauts and returning contributor, Pierre Wimmer. And we're discussing space tourism as it prepares for takeoff over the next 48 months. There has always been significant interest in the final frontier. And as commercial space companies work to make space tourism a viable market, we may not have to wait too long for the price of admission to come back down to Earth. Exciting scientific developments are funded by impressive levels of investment. In 2017, 120 venture capital funds put $3.9 billion into commercial space companies. Now, while most private aerospace companies are research-focused, a market for sending non-astronauts to space is emerging. As flights become autonomous and no longer require a trained astronaut to operate the craft. In the next decade, the value of the space industry as a whole is expected to double from 400 billion to 800 billion. While Bezos was expected to be the first of the private space entrepreneurs to board a suborbital flight, he was beaten by Richard Branson. Virgin Galactic is has a primary focus on tourism, and the Virgin brand experience is a selling point of Virgin Galactic's offering, which is advertised on luxury experience websites even as of now. For 250,000 US dollars, a Virgin Galactic space tourist can expect a 90 minute tour after three days of training. Though COVID-19 saw the slowest quarter for space infrastructure since 2009, last year was the largest on record for investment in infrastructure, reaching over $5 billion. In the first quarter of this year, space infrastructure companies raised the combined $3.6 billion. So things are moving very fast, my friends. And here to break it all down and dive deeper is astronaut Pierre Wimmer. Welcome back. So nice to have you on again, superstar. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be back on uh, on the air here to, together with you. Yes, these segments are always so fun and insightful. Wow, you are sporting quite the outfit for those of you that are listening. He is wearing a fabulous space jacket. Please tell me how this came to uh, to, to, to appear on your body. This is quite intriguing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I thought I'd dress up for the occasion today. This is actually a commemorative Apollo 11 space jacket um, that I was I was given uh, for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing on the moon. Uh, and it was actually a, a big, big event that took place in uh, at the um, Reagan Center just outside L.A. And um, uh, and I was there together with uh, Buzz Aldrin, um, part of at the Apollo 11 mission and Charlie Duke, who was Capcom on Apollo 11 and later uh, went up on Apollo 16, both fabulous astronauts, really, really wonderful people. So it was a great delight. And for good measure, Walt uh, Cunningham was also there. Uh, so it w I was really, truly in the presence of history there. And, and yes, that also uh, led to this this jacket that I, I kept for forever and ever as, as, as a good memory. But uh, it has a very wonderful sort of uh, late 60s, early, early 70s feel to space. You wear it well. It looks, it looks delicious. You uh, wear it well. You. Okay, thank now, you. well, let's go back to the basics here, right? And I'm going to want to circle back uh, for our listeners, but an important distinction in space tourism is between suborbital space flight. Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin and Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic are both developing suborbital flights. Talk to me about orbital flights versus suborbital flights and what they mean for space tourism. Yeah, sure. So there's, there's been a bit of debate about where, where does the frontier of space truly lie? Um, most people would agree certainly above 80 kilometers um, and some would argue even 100 kilometers. Uh, depends who you ask, to be perfectly honest. Um, uh, but but around that 80 to 100 kilometers mile is, is kind of where you find suborbital uh, propositions such as galactic, such as uh, blue origin. Once you start to actually leave uh, that and you go into lower, lower, lower Earth orbit or LEO and, and you start to head up towards the International Space Station and beyond, um, you are then uh, doing an orbital space flight. Um, and that's where you can effectively uh, fly around the Earth if you so desire and if the rocket is strong enough for it, or, in, or indeed you can fly all the way up to the moon. Uh, so that's the difference between suborbital and orbital. In terms of pricing, I know you talked a lot about numbers a minute ago, um, it has a very, very big cost implication. Uh, it might not sound a lot for, because the International Space Station cruises are around 400 kilometers up. So from 100 kilometers to 400, not a big difference in numbers, but a very, very big difference in terms of 
capital required to get that extra mile up or those extra miles up uh, in terms of complexity, safety, uh, etc. So there's actually a very big difference. Uh, and, and, and in terms of cost, you, you, you said you, you can fly to space. Actually, on Galactic now, the ticket price is $450,000. To go orbital, you're probably looking at a minimum spend of $50, $60 million. So very significant wow, capital increase. Wow, that's once you very, very mm-hmm. different. Yeah, thank you for that uh, for that information. Now, well, despite numerous obstacles, right, from cost to safety to technological restrictions, space tourism, space tourism is a sector that is really set to develop rapidly over the next decade. And the successful development of reu- reusable launch systems is a big step towards lowering costs enough to make it a viable market. Talk to me uh, real quick about the importance of these reusable rockets and what that means for, for the dollar and for space tourism in general. Reusability is really the key thing to bringing bring down the cost. And, and this was the sort of thing that Elon Musk realized early on when he tried to initially uh, get involved with Russian rockets and they kind of didn't want to talk to him. So he ended up starting SpaceX. And one of the very key drivers were reusability. So when you see a, a Falcon 9, rocket launch, you, you see that they are, it's, a lot of it is coming back down to Earth as being reused for the next launch, etc. Same with Galactic. Yes, they're parts of the engine. They'll be replaced, etc. But it's essentially the same rocket and same mothership that goes up again. And same with Blue Origin. So it is very much the key is reusability. If you look at uh, space flights uh, before, so take the shuttle when that was flying, when NASA was flying it, you would look at an all-in cost per flight of roughly $500 million plus minus. With SpaceX and Falcon 9, uh, you look at a, at a price of about $60, $62 million. So an enormous saving. And that's what private enterprise can do, bringing down the cost and, and making things more e- efficient. But you couldn't do that without uh, yeah, reusability. Exactly. And, you know, while the only way up to space is via a rocket, there are two ways to come back down, right? Via a winged vehicle like, like the space shuttle or or galactic spaceship two, or via capsule like Apollo or Blue Origin's New Shepard. Now, these experiences are very are quite different. Please explain. Sure, they are very uh, very different. I mean, the classic Apollo would be a capsule where you splash down in the water. You got three parachutes that come up, or indeed, if you're flying Soyuz, which is the workhorse of the Russian program, you would be landing uh, somewhere uh, in in out of nowhere in Kazakhstan with one parachute, but also a capsule. And, and you effectively experience the equivalent of a small car crash. Uh, wow. Because you get, that, you get that bump when you land. Now, uh, when you're sitting in a Soyuz capsule, you actually have custom made, a very, very comfortable, almost like a cradle for adults uh, kind of uh, seating. And, and, and so you are comfortable, but you do get in, go, go through a, a mini car crash when you land and that's expected. Um, that's, that's when you when you fly on uh, on galactic it's a it's a different thing because we would we would fly up to an altitude of 16 kilometers drop down the rocket and then phew, up it goes into space and upon return uh, re-entry into the atmosphere and then the way it lands is basically at, at the same spaceport that it took off from in new mexico and it lands just like the shuttle would land three legs down and it it, it lands on the runway uh, horizontally just like you've seen in the space shuttle yeah yeah and you know and this these rough rides is kind of what makes me a little bit, uh, not not nervous, but I mean, going up to space is requiring a lot and the potential for private space travel is growing and it's only natural to wonder what if something does go wrong? Well, you know, with more chances to send people into space comes the greater potential for mishaps. You know, in the time since we figured out how to launch humans into space, 18 people have died. Although it's pretty much impossible to find a working astronaut with a serious health issue, the case is not the same for tourists, especially if those tourists are older. Um, so what do you do then? I mean, what happens if there is this kind of mishap or even death, per se, in space? Um, sure. I mean, the biggest risk, if you like, to the mission, uh, people think always it's the launch because you have such a release of energy. And when you see the shuttle goes up, there's all, all these flames and it, it always looks like big fireworks. But actually, the biggest part of uh, or the biggest risk is actually reentry when you come back into Earth. You've been out in space and you come in and you experience 3000 degrees of cell degrade outside the capsule or your spaceship. And, and you have to come in at the right angle because if you come in too soft, you would bounce back out again. And good luck coming back down from there. You're stuffed, basically. Or you come in too steep and you'll burn uh, because the, 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 the heat is just too much. Um, but what do you do if something happens? Well, here's, here's the 
good news and the bad news, if you like. If, if you were to die in space, it does go pretty quickly. So the biggest risk for a NASA astronaut would be if he or she does an EVA, i.e. steps outside the rocket and, and, and has the, the famous white suit on, space suit on, the biggest risk is to be hit by a little micro uh, meteorite uh, that will go through the suit in, in no time. If that were to happen, you die within 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, first thing that would happen is you would, uh, you would decompress. Um, your water in your skin, your blood and all that would evaporate. Um, so within 10, 15 seconds, you're, you're toast, basically. So it does wow. go enormously quickly. Uh, and obviously, if doing an EVA, you'll just be hanging out there and you basically float away. If an accident were to happen within the International Space Station, which is could be likely as well, that could be hit by something. Um, uh, or if you were an astronaut were to die up there, uh, that's actually not not good news, uh, not only for the astronaut, but also for the fellow astronaut, because uh, the biohazard of having a, a dead corpse in space is 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 potentially a desert. I mean, it, 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 a risk. It would. Uh, it yes. Could, it could. Rot, it could rot. This it, is all fascinating. Mm -hmm. We have about one minute left, so I just want to. I want to make sure we get it all. In sure. Time. No, no, absolutely, and and um, so, so that's a that's a that's a big risk. But what do you do? How do you get it back down? Interesting enough, NASA doesn't have procedures for for this. Uh, you'd have thought that they would have it. They're working on it. Um, but what do you do? What you have to do is put the body in the coldest place. Uh, just like you would do on a submarine if something goes wrong. You put the body next to the torpedoes because that's the coldest place. So it slows down the decay of, of, the, of the body. Um, that, that's what you have to do as much as possible. Yeah, and then you I... can either send the body out into space or you'd have to find a way to decompose it. Decompose it. Wow, wow. This is all interesting, incredible stuff that we actually have to be speaking about uh, on, on a real world, uh, real time level because space travel is where we are headed. And this is something that has to be addressed sooner versus later. So thank you for coming on my friend and enlightening us once again on our Fly Me to the Moon segment. Thank you. See you in space at Astra. Abs yes, absolutely. I'm coming with you. Everybody, you have to check out Mr. Per Wimmer. Check out his website, wimmerspace.com, or you can check him out on the gram at wimmerspace and at per.wimmer. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. That was our Fly Me to the Moon segment. 